Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Library Love for Library Reads. I'm Susan McGuire, Senior Editor, Collection Management and Library Outreach at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click the Q&A uh, and type your message into the box that appears. We'll do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Also, Booklist will now be offering closed captioning on all webinars, hooray! To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Last but not least, Links to today's slides and a title list were included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download them, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the slides and title list by copying the URLs on this screen into your web browser. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from Golda Rademacher, Library Sales and Marketing Director at W.W. Norton & Company, Virginia Stanley, Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins Publishers, Melissa Croce, Marketing Manager at Simon & Schuster, Sydney Check, Marketing Coordinator at Penguin Random House Library Marketing, and Rebecca Vanuck, Exe Executive Director of Library Reads. First, we'll hear from Golda Rademacher. Golda is the Library Sales and Marketing Director at W.W. Norton & Company, which is an independent and employee-owned publisher that was founded in 1923. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram at W.W. Norton Library. Take it away, Golda. Thank you, Susan. Hello, everyone. Like Susan said, I'm Golda, and I handle library marketing for Norton. Here is my contact info. And I have a new YouTube channel where I'm posting book buzz videos and recordings of some of our events. Next slide. Michael Lewis, you know what to do with this. In The Premonition, Lewis talks to the people who've been researching pandemics and trying to avert catastrophe. This comes out in May and he'll be all over the news and radio and your patrons will be looking for it. Next slide. The Last Commandment by Scott Shepard is being published by Mysterious Press in July. A Scotland Yard detective is tracking a serial killer from London to New York. Each of the deaths correspond to a transgression of one of the Ten Commandments, and Grant must find the killer before the remaining commandments are commemorated with homicides. Scott Shepard is a veteran television writer, and this twisty tale leads from the seedy back alleys of Piccadilly, to the Grand Dame hotels of Midtown Manhattan and back again. Next slide. Mrs. March by Virginia Fito. This is a slow burn psychological suspense novel that has already been optioned for film by Elizabeth Moss. One reader called it Mrs. Dalloway meets Shirley Jackson and another compared it to Patricia Highsmith. This will keep you asking questions all the way through, wondering what is going on and then bam, there's a killer ending. You can hear more from the author at Library Journal Day of Dialogue on May 6th, and Library Reads votes are due by July 1st. Next slide. Uh, next, I have a memoir called Blind Man's Bluff. At age 16, James Tate Hill was diagnosed with Lieber's hereditary optic neuropathy, a condition that left him only a small amount of peripheral vision. When high school friends stopped calling and a counselor advised him to just aim for C's in his classes, he tried to escape the stigma by pretending he could still see. He kept this up through college and even through his first marriage, but the stress of faking it finally became too much. When he finally admitted that he was legally blind and was honest with friends and family, his world opened up instead of crashing down on him. American Estrangement by Saeed Serafizadeh is a short story collection with stories set all over the country. 
The stories are full of the kind of emotionally bruised characters familiar to readers of Dennis Johnson and George Saunders. These are people contending with internal struggles at the same time that they are battered by larger, often invisible, economic, political, and racial forces of American society. He has been published in The New Yorker and The Paris Review and many other literary magazines. Poison for Breakfast is the first Lemony Snicket book for adults. Well, really it's fine for teens and adults, but it's more philosophical than his kids' books, so we're printing it in the adult section. After finishing his delicious breakfast that he prepared himself, Lemony Snicket notices a note slipped under the door. It says, you had poison for breakfast. Following a winding trail of clues, Snicket takes us on a thought-provoking tour of his predilections and curiosities as he tries to solve the mystery. The novel has a typical use of asides and tangents that you expect from a Lemony Snicket book, but it's not as dark as the series of unfortunate events. You probably know Richard Powers from his Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Overstory. He's back with a new novel, Bewilderment, publishing in September. Bewilderment shares some overall themes of the natural world with The Overstory. The book looks at the impact of the broken world on our children. This is a father and son story with a father doing everything he can to help his troubled young son. Movie rights have already been sold and we expect to see reviews and interviews in all the major print and online and radio outlets. And I will do an ARC giveaway in the library newsletter and I should have digital ARCs up on Edelweiss in a few weeks. So this is another big book for us coming out in September, a new book by Mary Roach. The cover of Fuzz will be revealed later this month, so I can't show it to you yet. All of Mary Roach's books contain entertaining science writing, and she has a wonderful way of explaining things. Fuzz takes us into the world of animal and human interaction. What happens when it goes wrong? And how can humans and animals better coexist when humans keep expanding their habitat? We are also reissuing Stiff in a new paperback edition in August, with a new afterword and the new cover that you can see on the slide. Mary Roach will be speaking on a booklist webinar along with Glory Edom and Lance Samantha Chang on June 21st. So please watch out for the registration info coming from booklist or in my library newsletter. Joy Harjo is writing a new memoir for us that is coming out in September. Poet Warrior is the follow-up to her memoir, Crazy Brave. Weaving together the voices that shaped her, Harjo brings together stories of ancestors and family, the poetry and music that she first encountered as a child, the teachings of a changing earth, and the poets that paved her way. Poet Warrior is a luminous journey that sings with all the jazz, blues, tenderness, and bravery that we know as distinctly Joy Harjo. The Lost Notebook of Edouard Manet by Maureen Gibbon is perfect for your fans of historical fiction about real people. Maureen Gibbon did tons of research, even reading Manet's own letters, and she writes this novel as a diary of Manet's last years, around the time that he painted his final masterpiece. The book also includes some of Manet's sketches as illustrations. This is being published as a paperback original and should appeal to book groups, fans of novels about art or Paris, and historical fiction fans. Damascus Station is a fast-paced thriller set mostly in Paris and Syria by former CIA analyst David McCloskey. There's even a little bit of romance in the book with a forbidden love story to help offset all the intense action. Give this to your fans of David Ignatius, Daniel Silva, Martin Cruz Smith, and the Red Sparrow series by Jason Matthews. Glory Edom, the founder of Well Read Black Girl, is starting an anthology series called the Well Read Black Girl Library. The first book on girlhood collects 15 stories from such luminaries as Zora Neale Hurston, Edwidge Donticott, Danielle Evans, and more. Divided by theme, this collection explores the power and the precariousness of Black adolescence as these young women contend with the trials that shape who they are and what they'll become. 
The series will highlight famous and lesser known Black women authors whose work remains timeless. And Gloria Adam will also be on our Booklist webinar with Mary Roach on June 21st. And here we have another thriller, this one from Scarlet Publishers, Five Strangers by E.V. Adamson. Five Strangers is set in London, where five people witness a murder on Hampstead Heath. But was what they saw real? Could one of the witnesses have actually been a target? I hope to find out myself as soon as the arcs are ready. What Storm, What Thunder by Miriam Chansey is the lead title for Tin House Books this fall, and we already have a quote from Edwidge Danticott who called it sublime. The novel is set in Haiti before, during, and after the Port-au-Prince earthquake of 2010. Chansey weaves together 10 different characters into a fascinating and incredibly moving novel. The book is a reckoning of the heartbreaking trauma of disaster and an unforgettable testimony to the tenacity of the human spirit. In New York, My Village is a new novel by Uwam Akpan, whose previous book was an Oprah Book Club pick. The main character is a Nigerian editor who wins a fellowship at a publishing company in New York. But while his sophisticated colleagues meet him with kindness and hospitality, he is soon exposed to the industry's colder, ruthlessly commercial underbelly, boorish and hostile neighbors, and beneath a superficial cosmopolitanism, a bedrock of white cultural superiority and racist assumptions about Africa, its peoples, and its food. Haunted by the devastating darkness of civil war, and searingly observant about the ways that tribalism defines life everywhere from the villages of Africa to the villages within New York City. New York, my village, is full of heart, hilarity, and hope. Uwam Akpan will be a panelist at Library Journal Day of Dialogue on May 6th. Coming from Mysterious Press in November is The Left-Handed Twin, a new book in the Jane Whitefield series by Thomas Perry. Jane Whitefield is his most popular character, and it's been too long since the last book. Whitefield, who is usually helping other people to hide, is herself the target this time and will have to use all her knowledge and experience to evade the group of criminals who are coming after her. And lastly, I'm not expecting anyone to vote for this for Library Reads, but I can't leave you without announcing one of our other biggest books of the fall, Paul McCartney's The Lyrics. There's more information on this in the Edelweiss catalog that I will link in the chat. And please reach out if you have any questions. All of my print ARC giveaways will be through the Norton Library newsletter, so I'll put a link to subscribe in the chat. And of course, we also post our digital ARCs on Edelweiss and NetGalley as soon as they're ready. Thank you all so much for listening. And thank you, Golda. We'll now hear from Virginia Stanley. Virginia is the Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins. She was included in Library Journal's inaugural Movers and Shakers edition, being called a bridge builder because of her outreach to libraries across the country and including libraries on author tours as often as possible. She enjoys coming of age books, Broadway shows, and any song sung by Cher. The floor is yours, Virginia. Thank you. Um, yes, it's lovely to be here. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm excited about these books, so we'll just get right to it. Next. All of our social media is right here on Library Love Fest, so please go there, get whitelisted to receive e-galleys and the like. Next, please. Next slide, please. Not going? Okay, I'm just going to keep talking. Um, well, we have Door to Door every Tuesday on Facebook Live where we interview authors. So please come and check us out on Facebook Live, Library Love Fest. Next slide, please. And the first book up, The Stranger in the Mirror by Liv Constantine. I'm sure you all know this author. This is the best-selling uh, writing team of sisters Lynn Constantine and Valerie Constantine. Uh, their book, The Last Mrs. Parrish, was a Reese Witherspoon pick. They've also written The Last Time I Saw You, The Wife Stalker. I love, love, love the way... The, this author, these two women write, and um, The Stranger in the Mirror is 
a psychological thriller about a woman with no recollection of her past. So we meet this woman, Addison. She's about to get married, but she is not looking forward to the big day, not because of anything wrong with her fiance, but she doesn't really know who she is. A few years prior, she was found on the New Jersey highway bleeding and she was rescued. And while her physical wounds healed, her memory never returned. So she doesn't know her real name or where she came from, but she can't shake the notion that she may have done something very, very bad. Um, and then we meet Julian uh, over in the uh, Boston suburbs, who's trying to figure out what happened to his loving wife, Cassandra, who disappeared without a trace two years ago. She would never have left him and their seven-year-old daughter, would she? Lives are intersecting, and the book hooks readers with a riveting drama told with Liv Constantine's hallmark blend of glamour, tense psychological thrills, and jaw-dropping twists. Next slide, please. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers, the award-winning poet and essayist, makes her debut fiction. Uh, this is an, an epic story, sweeping novel, with the freshness and forcefulness of home, um, home going the Turner House, and the Water Dancer. We meet Ailey Pearl Garfield, who spends her summers in the small Georgia town where her mother's family has lived since their ancestors arrived from Africa in bondage. Growing up, she struggles with this duality because she is living in the city. Uh, she's the daughter of an accomplished doctor and a strict school teacher, but uh, she lives with this duality, this battle for belonging that shapes her identity. On one side are her very exacting parents and her imperious light-skinned grandmother to whom skin color is paramount. On the other hand, uh, Ailey feels um, the pull of the deep country and her mother's land tending family whose forebears endured the horrors of slavery and Jim Crow. She tries to come to terms with who she is and what she wants and embarks on a journey through her family's past uncovering shocking and unexpected tales of generations of ancestors, black, indigenous, and white in the deep south. And in doing so, she learns to embrace her full heritage, a legacy of oppression and resistance, bondage and independence, cruelty and resilience that is the story of the black experience in America itself. I wish I had time to read every single rave that I have here about this book. I don't. Publishers Weekly gave it a starred review uh, called it a staggering ambitious saga. Jacqueline Woodson said in her deft hands, the story of race and love in America becomes the great American novel. Angie Thomas says this is an outstanding portrait of the American family and in turn an outstanding portrait of America. Dolan's Dolan Perkins Valdez, author of Wench and Bomb, says, if you read one book this year, choose this one. I cannot say enough about this book. The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois. Next title, please. London's number one dog walking agency by Kate McDougall. This is a debut memoir, very uh, unconventional coming of age story about a young woman who starts her own dog walking company. Back in 2006, uh, Kate McDougal was working at Sotheby's in London, not loving it. There was a clumsy accident. There was a precious piece of art that almost got broken. And she said, I'm leaving and I'm going to set up my own dog walking company. Not that she knew too much about dogs or business, but she did it. And she has turned this experience into this delightful, sharp, um, uh, beautiful coming of age story told through the dogs and the London homes and the neighborhoods they inhabit. One walk at a time, she journeys from a haphazard 20 something to a happily and surprisingly settled adult with love, relationships, drama and home ownership along the way. So yes, this is fun. This is, uh, this is, this is breezy. This is um, coming of age sweet, but it's also got a lot of real revelations about human foibles, urban life, classism and income inequality, all rendered with a very light touch and, uh, and um, and just a just a wonderful feel good book. Um, this was um, uh, Ruth Hogan, author of the bestseller Keeper of Lost Things. So this is a glorious treasure of a book, starring a cornucopia of canines and their hapless humans. It tickles the funny bones and tugs at the heartstrings. Hugely entertaining. Next slide, please. Uh, the Women's March by Jennifer Chiaverini. This is the author who wrote the bestseller uh, Resistance Woman. Women, and this is the story of three women who bravely risk their lives and liberty in the fight to win the vote. So you meet these three women who um, who are fighting to change um, history uh, by having uh, this vote in Washington, D.C. to win the right for women's votes on March 3rd, 1913. This what this uh, took place. We see um, Alice Paul, Maud Malone, Ida B. Wells, 
And this is the 19th century suffrage movement in the United States, which resulted in voting rights for women in all but nine states when Woodrow Wilson was president. It's absolutely fabulous. Go to Edelweiss to read all about the back way, um, uh, backless, uh, backstory, sorry. Island Queen, next slide. Stunning historical novel about the life of Dorothy Kerwin Thomas, who was born into slavery, slavery in the West Indies, rose to freedom, became so wealthy and powerful that British Columbia colonial government would levy new taxes specifically to drain her personal fortune and curtail her influence. It's a true story. Um, and uh, Dolly, as she was known, is among the many brilliant and triumphant black women whose lives have been largely passed over by history. Vanessa Riley, uh, is an award-winning novelist whose historical romances have always been set in multicultural communities in Regency and Victorian England. Next slide, please. The Reading List by Sasha Nisha Adams. This is an unforgettable and heartwarming warming debut novel about how a chance encounter with a list of library books helps forge an unlikely relationship between two very di different people. Uh, we meet this uh, widower uh, who lives in the London borough of Ealing. He's lost his wife, he's very, uh, he's bereft, and he worries about his granddaughter who's very much uh, in sort of like hiding in her room and reading and he, they just can't connect. Um, he goes to the library and meets an anxious teenager who works at the library and he, she helps him connect uh, with his granddaughter through a list of books that she has found crumpled up in the back of To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a list of novels that she had never read she reads them, they help transport her world, and in turn, she gives it to him to help connect with his granddaughter. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, Black, next slide, please. Black Girls Must Die Exhausted by Jane Allen. A perennial is a division of Harper, and they are positioning this as a major read. This is the first in the captivating Own Voices uh, three book series that had been self published. It's about a young woman who is faced with an unexpected fertility diagnosis, and she na navigates her romantic life, her professional ambition, and complex family matters with the help of her two longtime friends. This is the perfect blend of highly readable commercial fiction uh, with important relatable issues such as infertility, black maternal health, mental health, infidelity, infidelity, familial and romantic love, and female friendships. It's just amazing. And the last book I have on my list is The Sisters of Auschwitz. Next slide, please. This is by Roxanne Van Ipperin. Um, 200,000 an ounce print on this book. It's the true story of two unsung heroes of World War II, these two sisters, Yanni and Leanne Brielslipper. They joined the Dutch resistance, helped save dozens of lives captured by the Nazis and survived the Holocaust. Um, it was eight months after Germany's invasion into Poland, the Nazis rolled into the Netherlands. Um, and by 1943, resistance was growing. And among those fighting the, the occupiers were these two sisters. Um, they sheltered, uh, people in this safe house in the woods that they called the High Nest. And it was one of the most important safe houses in the country. Uh, when the house and its occupants were betrayed, the most terrifying time of the sisters' lives began. Um, and as the Allied troops closed in, the Brill Slipper family was rushed onto the last train to Auschwitz, along with Anne Frank and her family. This tests the sisters' bonds between beyond human imagination and they're stripped of everything but their courage, with resilience, and their love for each other. It's based on meticulous research, unprecedented access to the Brill Slippers' personal archives of memoir photos. It's a long overdue commendation to these two young women's uh, heroism and moral bravery. This is a big book for us and uh, I'm proud to have it on our list as I am of all the others. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much, Virginia. Next up is Melissa Croce. Melissa is a recent addition to the Simon & Schuster Education and Library team joining in November 2020 as the marketing manager. She loves to recommend titles, especially literary fiction, nonfiction, and rom-coms. When she's not reading, Melissa can be found writing, taking long walks around her neighborhood like a Jane Austen heroine, and spending way too much time online. Take it away, Melissa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here this afternoon. I am thrilled to introduce some upcoming titles, all of which you can request to read right now, either on NetGalley or Edelweiss. Additionally, on the bottom of every slide after this one will be our social media website, uh, media and website info. So make sure you make a note of it and follow us. Next. First up for fiction, next. You may know Lisa Tadeo from her New York Times bestseller, Three Women, and now she is turning that talent towards fiction with the scorching debut novel, Animal. Joan has spent a lifetime enduring the cruel acts of men, but when one of them commits a shocking act of violence in front of her, 
she flees New York City in search of Alice, who is the only person alive who can help her make sense of her past. In the sweltering hills above Los Angeles, Joan unravels the horrific events she witnessed as a child that has haunted her every waking moment while forging the power to finally strike back. Animal is a depiction of female rage at its rawest and a visceral exploration of the fallout from a male-dominated society. And votes for this are due very soon on May 1st. Next. This is The Missing Treasures of Amy Ashton by Eleanor Ray. Amy Ashton once dreamed of becoming an artist of creating beautiful objects, but now she simply collects them. Having suffered a terrible tragedy, one she staunchly refuses to let herself think about, thank you very much, she's decided that it's easier to love things than people. Things are safe, things never leave you. And for those of you who have seen Parks and Rec, this is a very Tom Haverford attitude to have, except you know, with more trauma. But when a family moves in next door with two young boys, one of whom has a collection of his own, Amy's carefully managed life starts to unravel, prompting her to question why she began to close herself off in the first place. As Amy embarks on a journey back to her past, she has to contend with nosy neighbors, a meddlesome government worker, the inept police, and a little boy whose love of bulldozers might just let Amy open up her heart and her home again. Quirky and charming, big hearted and moving, this novel proves that it's never too late to let go of the things that don't matter and to welcome the people who do. And again, Library Reads votes for this are also due very soon on May 1st. Next. Kristen Harmel, the New York Times bestselling author of the Book of Lost Names, returns with The Forest of Vanishing Stars. After being stolen from her wealthy German parents and raised in the unforgiving wilderness of Eastern Europe, a young woman finds herself alone in 1941 after her kidnapper dies. Her solitary existence is interrupted, however, when she happens upon a group of Jews fleeing the Nazi terror. Stunned to learn what's happening in the outside world, she vows to teach the group all she can about surviving in the forest. And in turn, they teach her some surprising lessons about opening up her heart after years of being alone. But when she is betrayed and escapes into a German occupied village, her past and her present come together in a shocking collision that could change everything. Library Reads votes are due for this on June 1st. And this spring, Kristen will be at TLA. So just coming up this week, as the Book of Lost Names was named to the 2021 Lariat list, she will also be participating in Library Journal's upcoming Day of Dialogue Festival on May 6th. Next. Here is The Startup Wife by Tamina. Tamima Anam, where readers come for the radical vision of human connection and stay for the wickedly funny feminist look at startup culture and modern partnership. Brilliant coder and possessor of a pie tattoo, that's P.I., Asha Ray is poised to revolutionize artificial intelligence when she is reunited with her high school crush, Cyrus Jones. Cyrus inspires Asha to write a new algorithm, and before she knows it, she's Abandon her PhD program, they've exchanged wedding vows and gone to work at an exclusive tech incubator called Utopia, which specializes um, in religious rituals for people. The platform becomes a sensation with millions of users seeking personalized rituals every day. Will Cyrus and Asha's marriage survive the pressures of sudden fame or will she become overshadowed by the man everyone is calling the new Messiah? Votes for this are due on June 1st. Next. All right, moving on to thrillers and horror next. We have The Other Black Girl by Zakia Delila Harris, a novel that's taking the book world by storm. Publishing assistant Nella Rogers loves her job, but is tired of being the only black employee at Wagner Books. When Hazel starts working there, Nella is thrilled. Finally, someone she can compare hair care routines with, someone she could complain about workplace racial microaggressions with, and with someone who by her mere presence makes it so that Nella is no longer the only black girl at Wagner. But when Hazel quickly rises above Nella, becoming the office favorite, and things go from bad to worse when sinister notes appear on Nella's desk, saying, leave Wagner now. But who is sending these notes and why? Nella soon realizes that what's at play there isn't just petty workplace drama, but instead something far more sinister. Shining an unflinching light on the various facets of workplace racism, this crackling debut draws you in at the first page and keeps you firmly in its grip moving you as swiftly and thrillingly as any roller coaster, each turn building to the final gasping twist. Votes for this are due on May 1st. Next. All right, I am not able to tell you too much about Falling, the debut thriller by TJ Newman, but I can tell you this, it is gonna be one of the best thrillers that you've read all summer, hands down. Don't believe me? Get a load of this premise. So you just board a flight to New York. There are 143 other passengers on board. What you don't know 
is that 30 minutes before the flight, your pilot's family was kidnapped. For his family to live, everyone in your plane must die. The only way for the family to survive, survive is if the pilot follows his orders and crashes the plane. Enjoy your flight. Votes for this are due on June 1st. Next. From New York Times bestselling author Megan Miranda comes Such a Quiet Place, a new novel about a mysterious murder in a close-up neighborhood. Hollow's Edge used to be such a quiet, idyllic place, but then came the murders of Brandon and Fiona Truitt. A year and a half later, what once was a paradise is now a nightmare. The residents are trapped, unable to sell their homes, and suffocated by their trial testimonies that implicated one of their own, their old neighbor, Ruby Fletcher. But now Ruby's back. Her conviction has been overturned, and she waltzes right back into Hollow's Edge and into the home she once shared with her friend Harper Nash. Harper, five years older, has always treated Ruby like the wayward younger sister. But now she's terrified. What possible good could come of Ruby returning to the scene of the crime? And how could Harper turn her away when she knows that Ruby has nowhere else to go? Within days, it becomes increasingly clear that not everyone told the truth about what happened the night of the Truett's murders. And when Harper begins receiving threatening notes, she realizes she has to uncover the truth before someone else becomes the killer's next victim. Votes for this are due on June 1st. Next. Here we have My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones, the latest from this acclaimed author. Think of this book as the lottery meets Friday the 13th. Jay Daniels is an angry half Indian outcast with an abusive father, an absent mother, and an entire town that wants absolutely nothing to do with her. She lives in her own world, a world in which protection comes from an unusual source, horror movies, especially the ones where a mass killer seeks revenge on a town or a world that is wrong them. But when Jane's, Jade's own small town begins to resemble a horror film, she pulls readers into her dizzying encyclopedic mind of blood and mass murders and is able to prophesize exactly how this plot will unfold. Yet even as Jade drags readers into her dark fever dream, a surprising and intimate portrait emerges, one of a scared and traumatized little girl who is angry, but also one who cries, who loves, and who desperately wants a home. My Heart is a Chainsaw is her story. Next. All right, moving on into something completely different, which is to say romance. Next, we have The Soulmate Equation, the latest from the Library Reads Hall of Famers, Christina Lauren. Single mom Jess Davis is a data and statistics wizard, but no amount of number crunching can convince her to step back into the dating world. After being abandoned by parent, her parents and raised by her grandparents, Jess has been left behind too often to feel comfortable letting anyone in. After all, the last time she did that, her ex decided he wasn't quote unquote father material before her daughter Juno was even born. Staying afloat as a single mother is hard though, and lonely. But, but then Jess hears about genetically, genetic ally, a buzzy new DNA-based matchmaking company that's predicted to change dating forever. Finding a soulmate through DNA, this Jess understands. At least she thought she did until her test shows an unheard of 98% compatibility with another subject in the database. A man Jess already knows and who happens to be the genetic ally's founder, Dr. River Pena. This stuck up stubborn man is without a doubt not her soulmate, thanks but no thanks. But Genetic Ally has a proposition, get to know him and we'll pay you. Jess, who is barely making ends meet, is in no position to turn it down. And as the pair are dragged from one event to the next that could make Genetic Ally a mint in stock prices, Jess begins to realize that there might be more to the scientist and the science itself than she thought. Next. This is Heartbreak for Hire by Sonia Hartle. Frankly Saunders has a secret. Once a rising academic star following in her mom's footsteps, she's now an admin assistant to an insurance agency, or so most people think. But in reality, she works at Heartbreak for Hire, a secret service that specializes in revenge for jilted lovers, frenemies, and long-suffering coworkers with a little cash to spare and a man who needs to be taken down a notch or two. It's not as prestigious as academia, but it helps Brinkley save for her, dream, her own dreams and lets her exercise a few demons, all while helping to empower women. But when her boss announces she's hiring male heartbreakers for the first time, Brinkley's no longer sure she's doing the right thing, especially when her new coworker turns out to be a target she was paid to take down. Although Mark spends his days struggling up the academic ladder himself, he seems to be the opposite of a backstabbing adjunct, a nerd at heart in criminally sexy sweater vest who's attentive in and out of the bedroom. But as Berkeley finds it more, increasingly more difficult to focus on anything but Mark, she soon realizes that like herself, people aren't always who they appear to be. Next. All right, I'm gonna wrap things up with some new books from you and your patrons' favorite authors. Next. New York Times bestselling author big, of Big Summer, Jennifer Weiner is back with That Summer, another timely and deliciously twisty novel of intrigue, secrets, and the transformative power of female friendship. 
Everyone's favorite political thriller writer, Brad Thor, is back with Black Ice, the 20th book in the Scott Harvass series. And lastly, we have Lightning Strike by William Kent Kruger, a powerful prequel to his best-selling Cork O'Connor series, a book about fathers and sons and young Corks coming of age in the summer of 1963. Next. Okay, before I let you go, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you or remind you about all of our resources. I've already told you about our website and social media, but we also have the book drop. This is a website dedicated to being a resource for you. It's filled with a seasonal brochure filled with our department's recommendations, links to our full digital catalog, book trailers, and more. We also have book club favorites program. Fewer your colleagues are working on programming for your patrons and want authors involved in your book club discussions or events, let us know. Email us at bookclubfavorites at simonandschuster.com for details. Um, if you didn't catch all of this, don't worry, I'm gonna put links in the chat for you. Next. I know I've covered a lot, so please feel free to email me if you have any questions. Once again, um, I don't really have any physical arcs to send to anybody, but all of these are on NetGalley or Edelweiss for you to read right now. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Melissa. Our next panelist today will be Sydney Check. Sydney is a marketing coordinator at Penguin Random House. After graduating college with a degree in English, Sydney found her place within the library marketing department where she can share her love of books with others. When she isn't finding new ways to promote the latest titles, you can find her listening to podcasts, reading sappy love stories, and constantly comparing books to the movie remakes. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you, Susan. I'm so happy to be here today to chat with all of you about some fabulous books. Um, and just note that we will have these titles will be able to be requested on Edelweiss for easy e-reading. So let's move on to the books. Next slide, please. Um, first up, we've got Hell of a Book by Jason Mott. This big summer title is recommended for readers of Colson Whitehead, Brian Washington, Kevin Wilson, and Paul Oster. In Hell of a Book, an African-American author sets out on a cross-country book tour to promote his best-selling novel. That storyline drives the novel and is the scaffolding of something much larger and urgent. Since the novel also tells the story of Soot, a young Black boy living in a rural town in the recent past, and The Kid, a possibly imaginary child who appears to the author on his tour. An astounding work of fiction from a New York Times best-selling author, always deeply honest and at times electrically funny, that goes to the heart of racism, police violence, and the hidden costs exacted upon Black Americans in America as a whole. Next slide. Um, Paper Palace by Miranda Callie Heller is a perfect summer read for the beach, book clubs, and the like. Set against the summer backwoods and beaches of Cape Cod, the Paper Palace unfolds over 24 hours and across 50 years as decades of family legacy, love, lies, secrets, and one unspeakable childhood tragedy lead wife and mother, Elle Bishop, to the precipice of a life-changing decision. With its transporting setting and propulsive pace, the story draws on the sweet promise of young love, as well as the heartbreaking damage incurred by too many secrets. It's a compulsively readable story about the tensions between the romantic childhood ideals we grow up with and the family responsibilities that carry us into adulthood. Must our life choices remain irrevocable if the conditions are changed? Um, this is Miranda Callie Heller's first novel. Heller has worked as senior vice president and head of drama series at HBO, developing and overseeing such shows as The Sopranos, Six Feet Under, The, Wi the Wire, Deadwood, and Big Love, among others. So I'm sure this novel will be descriptive, rich, wildly propelling, similar to watching your favorite TV show. So we're super excited about this title. The next slide. Uh, Final Girl Support Group. Um, it's a fast-paced, thrilling horror novel that follows a group of heroines to die for, for the from the brilliant New York Times bestselling author, um, Grady Hendrix, who wrote The Southern Book Club Guides to Slaying Vampires, which is currently being adapted into a TV series. Uh, Grady Hendrix is known for his tongue-in-cheek self-aware writing, and the Final Girl Support Group does not disappoint. The final girl is the one who fought back, defeated the killer, the one who emerges bloody but victorious, but after the sirens fade and the audience moves on, what happens to her? Hendrix answers that question in an extremely gripping way, and like a good Hendrix book does, takes a microscope to how far we take our darker entertainment. Next slide. Uh, the Sinful Eyes of Trophy Wise by Kristen Miller. Uh, meet the trophy wives of Presidio Terrace, San Francisco's most exclusive and most deadly neighborhood. Mystery writer Brooke Davies is the new wife on the block. Her tech billionaire husband, Jack, 22 years her senior, whisked her to the Bay Area via private jet and purchased a modest mansion on the same day. 
He demands perfection, and before now, Brooke has had no problem playing the role of doting housewife. But as she befriends other wives on the street and spends considerable time away from Jack, he worries if he doesn't control Brooke's every move, she will reveal the truth behind their perfect marriage. Aaron King, famed news anchor and chair of the community board, is no stranger to maintaining an image, though being married to a plastic surgeon helps. But the skyrocketing success of her career has worn her love life thin, and her professional ambitions have pushed Mason away. Quitting her job is a Hail Mary attempt at keeping him interested to steer him away from finding a young trophy wife. But is it enough? And is Mason truly the man she thought she was? Georgia St. Clair allegedly cashed in on the deaths of her first two husbands, earning her the nickname Black Widow, and the stares and whispers of her curious neighbors. Rumored to have murdered both men for their fortunes, she claims to have found true love in her third marriage, yet her mysterious, captivating allure keeps everyone guessing. Then a tragic accident forces the residents of Presidio Terrace to ask, has Georgia struck again? And what is she really capable of doing to protect her secrets? This psychological thriller is perfect for fans of Lisa Jewell and Sherry LaPena. So it's a great one. Uh, next ghosts. As an avid romance reader, Dolly Alderton's ghosts had me at the description. For fans of Four Weddings and a Funeral, Bridget Jones' Diary, um, and author is like Nora Ephron. It's a story of Nina Dean. She's not especially bothered that she's single. She owns her apartment. She's about to publish her second book. She has a great relationship with her ex-boyfriend and enough friends to keep her social calendar full and her hangovers plentiful. And when she downloads a dating app, she does the seemingly impossible. She meets a great guy on her first date, but he disappears the moment he says, I love you. And then Nina is forced to deal with everything in her life that she's been trying so hard to ignore. Uh, David Nichols, author of One Day, said, witty, touching, without ever being sentimental, and hugely enjoyable. I'm so excited for this title. Uh, next slide. A uh, mismatch. For fans of The Bride Test and The Wedding Party, you will love this cross-generational story about love, family, faith, and finding yourself. And now that Soraya Nazari has graded from, graduated from university, she thinks it's time she gets some of the life experience that she feels she's still lacking, partly due to her upbringing. And Magnus Evans seems like the perfect way to get it. Whereas she's, the, whereas she's the somewhat timid, artistic daughter of Iranian immigrants, Magnus is the quintessential British lad. Because they have so little in common, Soraya knows that there's no way she could ever fall for him. So what's the harm in having a little fun as she navigates her post-grad life? Besides, the more she discovers about her mother's past and the strain between her parents, the less appealing marriage becomes. Before long, Soraya begins to realize that there's much more to Magnus than meets the eye. But could she really have a relationship with him? Is she more like her mother than she ever would have thought? You must continue to read to find out. Uh, next slide, please. A Beautiful Country is by Chen Julie Wang, an incandescent and heartrending memoir from an astonishing new talent. Beautiful Country puts readers in the shoes of an undocumented child living in poverty in the richest country in the world. In Chinese, the word for America, my go, translates directly to beautiful country. Yet, when seven-year-old Qian arrives in New York City in 1994, she is overwhelmed by crushing fear and scarcity. In China, Qian's parents were professors. In America, her family is illegal, and it will require all the determination and small joys they can muster to survive. In Chinatown, Qian's parents work in sweatshops and sushi factories instead of laughing at her jokes or watching her sing and dance. They fight constantly. Chen goes to school hungry, where she teaches herself English through library books, her only source of comfort. At home, Chen's headstrong and resilient mama ignores her own pain until she's unable to stand, too afraid of the cost and attention a hospital might, a visit might bring. And yet, young Chen, now acting as her mother's nurse, her family's translator, a student, and a worker, cannot ask for help. The number one rule in America still stands. To be noticed is to risk losing everything. Searing and unforgettable, Beautiful Country is an essential American story about a family fracturing under the weight of invisibility and a girl coming of age in the shadows who never stops seeking the light. Next slide, please. Um, the Maid. This is perfect for Agatha Christie fans and novels like The Thursday Murder Club and The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. Um, Molly Gray. Um, is not like everyone else. She struggles with social skills and misinterprets the intentions of others. Her grand used to interpret the world for her, codifying it into simple rules that Molly could live by. Since grand died a few months ago, 25-year-old Molly has had to navigate life's complexities all by herself. No matter, she throws herself with gusto into her work as a hotel maid. Her unique character, along with her obsessive love of cleaning and proper etiquette, make her an ideal fit for the job. 
She delights in donning her crisp uniform each morning, stocking her cart with miniature soaps and bottles and returning guest rooms at the Regency Grand Hotel to a state of perfection. But Molly's orderly life is turned on its head the day she enters the suite of the infamous and wealthy Charles Black, only to find it in a state of disarray and Mr. Black himself very dead in his bed. Before she knows what's happening, Molly's unusual demeanor has the police targeting her as the lead suspect. She quickly finds herself caught in a web of deception, one she has no idea how to untangle. Fortunately for Molly, friends she never knew she had unite with her in a search for clues to figure out what really happened to Mr. Black, but will they be able to find the real killer before it's too late? A clue like locked room mystery and a heartwarming journey of the spirit, the maid explores what it means to be the same as everyone else and yet entirely different, and reveals that all mysteries can be solved through the connection to the human heart. Next slide, please. Um, and here we have some fabulous authors that are el eligible for the Hall of Fame from the likes of Jasmine Guillory, Helen Ellis, Sherry LaPena, um, Sylvia Marino Garcia, and Elizabeth Strout. Make sure to check out their forthcoming titles that are coming out this summer and early fall. The next slide, please. And don't forget, library reads do make great listens. And we have on our Books on Tape website, we keep record of all of our library reads picks on audio. And they're always a great way to listen while you walk, listen while you cook, listen while you craft. And so just because these library reads picks are not only great to be read, but they're also great to be listened to. So definitely check out that tiny URL below. Uh, next slide, please. Amazing, thank you so much for your time. I had such a great time presenting these titles to you. And for more information and to request galleys, you can visit that tiny URL below um, and request away. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sydney. Our final panelist today will be the great Rebecca Vanuck. Rebecca is the executive director of Library Reads. She is an MLIS from Dominican University and worked as a public librarian for a decade before becoming the editor for collection management and library outreach at Booklist magazine from 2012 to 2017. Rebecca is the author of three reference books on the topic of women's fiction, as well as a best-selling book on weeding library collections. She lives in the Chicago suburbs with her husband and two tween sons, both of whom still love to read. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm so happy to be here. And I am just here to spend a short amount of time telling everyone about Library Reads and going through some quick details on how you can be part of our group. So Library Reads is a registered 501c6 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to connect adults with books that library staff across the country recommend. We also do free training and events for library staff centered on readers advisory for adult patrons. Library Reads advocates for adult books of all types, fiction and nonfiction, so please vote for your favorites every month. I know, what did we just get? Dozens of titles in this webinar. I was frantically scribbling on the back of my script here, all of these ones that I wanna rush over to Edelweiss and download right away. Hopefully you were all doing that as well. So get those books read and voted for. Um, anyone who works in a public library in the US is eligible to vote. It doesn't matter what your job is or what your title is, as long as you read adult books and love to share recommendations, you are in. The only requirement we have is that you do need to be signed up for NetGalley or Edelweiss or both as working in a public library. I will probably repeat this again in my next 10 minutes that you have to make sure that your profile is up to date and states the library that you work at. They sort those votes through for us, send them out to us, and that's how we um, tabulate all those votes. So get registered. Uh, you can go to our website. I'll show you that in just a second and get on those, set yourself up as public library and you'll be all set. Next slide. Okay, so the list comes out every month on the 15th, and we publish this list on our website along with a link to the PDF flyer that you can print out to use in your library for display or for handout purposes. You do the voting, we do the counting. We collect those votes via NetGalley and Edelweiss, and the top vote getter becomes the number one pick. This is a top 10 list every month with a variety of genres. Next slide. In 2018, we introduced the Hall of Fame. I know several of our folks today talked about Hall of Fame authors. So these are those favorite authors appearing regularly on the list. 
When an author's third title makes the list, they become a Hall of Famer. This recognizes popular authors while opening up space on the monthly list for a broad selection of new authors. Next slide. So you can find quick little videos on our YouTube channel that will walk you through using NetGalley and Edelweiss, as well as a video tutorial on how to write annotations for a chance to have your annotation featured on one of our monthly lists. So I'm sorry, I have an old URL up there on the screen. If you head to our, um, I mistyped it. If you head to our website, which is libraryreads.org and select the participate tab, which is right across the top of every screen, that's going to take you to several options where you can learn more about our process. I don't have time today to walk everybody through voting. Um, it's different on each site and yet also the same. So um, if you're not familiar already with using NetGalley and Edelweiss, um, we have a nice little like less than 10 minute video up on our YouTube channel. I'm going to put that in the chat actually. It's youtube.com slash library reads. Pretty easy to get to. Um, and you can watch a little video on it, screenshots and a little video tour of how to do your votes on both of those platforms. And as I mentioned, there is also a video there for how to write your annotations every month, along with other videos that we've done. But those are our two um, nice little mini ones right now. Okay, uh, next slide. I would also like to encourage you to follow our social media accounts. Like I said before, on the 15th of the month, we push the list out via our email newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website. And then we also post the list as individual title shots on our social media. Links to those feeds are on our website as well. Next slide. So why should you participate in Library Reads? Um, a number of reasons, right? To increase your familiarity with publishers, to increase your awareness of new books coming out, to enhance your readers' advisory skills, to improve patron experience by connecting readers to great new reads. Next slide. You can also use library reads in your library. Um, it's really great for collection development. You can check your, the list against your orders to make sure you've got those great books coming into your collection. You'll become more familiar with new books and new authors that are getting attention. Um, I do want to mention that Ingram, Baker and Taylor and other ordering platforms do create library reads carts for you pre-filled with those monthly list titles. So it's easy for you to just do like a, you know, one click buy that whole cart of those 10 books and the Hall of Famers, you're good to go. Um, it's also really one of the things I always like to say for how this helps you with readers advisory is these are 10 more books every month that you can pretend you've read. Uh, as we all know, our patrons think that we have read every book in the library um, or that we have hand selected every single book because we've read them all and want to share them. And this is, to me, it's, it's one more way you can have 10 more books kind of in your brain that you're ready to talk about. Um, our little blurbs give such a good, quick, you know, three sentence description of the book. So 10 more books you can know every month. Um, I find these lists are also great for book group possibilities. A lot of our annotations will point out when something is good for book group choices. And you should feel free to use our content um, on your library's Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, or website. We do try and create graphics that are easily shareable um, and we tag the libraries of people who annotate for us. Next slide. So we do have a full frequently asked question page on our website, but I wanted to point out some of the questions we get the most. So the important, most important thing is when do I vote? Votes are due by the first of every month. I'm pretty sure every single person on this webinar discussed after every, after reading you their little um, blurb about the book, they told you exactly when, to, when the vote was due. So it's always going to be the first of the month before the book's pub date. So right now we are voting for June publication dates and after. And yes, you can vote early. Um, just because it's June right now, you can also vote for July, August, September, anything that you've got an arc for. Um, so definitely you know, make sure that you're, you're paying attention to those dates. And there's not a limit to the number of titles you can vote for either. You can vote for as many as you want at a time. So get out there and vote for a bunch of them. If you um, wanted to know and weren't sure, Library Reads is just for adult titles. 
Um, we have had some YA, over, YA crossover titles in the past, but as of spring 2018, we clarified that it's too hard for us to try and keep track of that ourselves. So any book that is being published for the adult market, it will be very clear from our marketing friends. Um, there you go, no young adult, no kids. All genres and subject categories are welcome, fiction and nonfiction, and we welcome votes for any book by any publisher as long as you can find it listed in Edelweiss or NetGalley. And that is kind of an important thing to point out. Um, if you're voting from a print arc, that's not a problem. You don't have to have downloaded anything. You can have your print arc, but you might prefer to vote via Edelweiss at that point. NetGalley only allows you to vote for titles that you have requested and been approved for. Um, it does not mean that you have to read it or even download it. It just, or you do have to download it into your account. You don't have to download it and read it. Um, so if you've got a print galley and you still want to vote, that is perfectly fine. You might find it just a little easier to do that via Edelweiss. Next slide. So how do we get these ARCs, right? So you just heard from our fantastic publisher friends about their upcoming books, how to get them from them. At some point, we will get back to conferences, please. I'm banking on it. Um, I know that Book Expo is no more, but there's all kinds of things coming to take its place, ALA, state shows, et cetera. Those will all be back and that's where you can get print copies. But as all of my friends just told you today, you have their contact information um, and you can get on their mailing lists and you can be whitelisted for the downloads. So please make sure when you register for NetGalley and Edelweiss that you are filling in all of the necessary fields and that you are um, proclaiming that you work in a public library and that is what's gonna get you going. Most of our publishers, um, I probably all of them actually have staff devoted to library outreach. So we love all of our publisher friends. These are great publishers, are great people to contact when there's a specific, specific book that you want. Um, our pals over at earlyword.com have an excellent list of marketing contacts and their contact information. That URL is up there on the screen. They also host monthly galley chats on Twitter. That is the, I believe, first Thursday of the month. They are a great place to learn about upcoming titles. Um, if you go to earlyword.com slash galley chat, you can find all about that and how to do it. And it's lots of fun. And all of our publisher marketing friends hang out on those chats and they are paying attention to who's excited about what. And that's how you can reach them to get whitelisted or to get copies. It's really wonderful. So next slide. Library reads annotations. Now I'm not gonna to spend too much time going through this because we wanna wrap it up. And like I said, there is that nice little video on our website. There is also a section on our website that tells you how to write these if you don't wanna go and listen to that video. Um, but one of the things that truly I'm so proud of our list that makes it so special is that all the annotations come from library staff folks just like you. Um, we have some quick rules. There's a couple of those right there. Um, make sure you watch that video. We partner with our friends at Novelist to get read-alikes. So that's also kind of awesome. It's, it's something that we just think makes our list a little bit special. So please, um, you know, learn how to write some annotations because we love seeing those come through. And then to wrap it up, next slide. Um, give it a try. We edit them, which is kind of cool. So you can just write what you want and we'll get back to you and get it all figured out. No worries. All right, and then last slide. So on any of this, um, please feel free to email me at any time with questions that you might have. It's super simple. I'm Rebecca at librarybreads.org. And do check out our website for more information. Um, we have lots of uh, stuff on there, especially um, our frequently asked questions section is pretty good. The about us section is there, how to participate. Everything you need to know about us is on the website, librarybreads.org. Thank you so much for your time today, everyone. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and a big thank you to all of today's wonderful panelists. So tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's slide presentation, title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like the ones you see here. Did you know registration for ALA's virtual annual conference and exhibition is now open? Taking place between June 23rd and 29th, 
This year's conference will feature amazing speakers, educational programming, and an opportunity to connect with colleagues and librarians everywhere. Plus, if you register before April 30th, you'll save on registration rates. Visit 2021.alaannual.org for more details. For even more library love, including tips on reader's advisory and collection development, the scoop on new and forthcoming books, and interviews with authors and librarians everywhere, tune into Booklist Shelf Care, the podcast at soundcloud.com slash shelf hyphen care. You can also subscribe to Shelf Care, the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts. Not yet a subscriber to Booklist the Magazine? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. One more thank you to our sponsors, W.W. Norton & Company, HarperCollins Publishers, Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House Library Marketing, and Library Reads. This concludes today's webinar.